This episode is sponsored by Skillshare. What is going on Solo fam? My name is John Solo and you are watching Messed Up Origins, the show where I take the myths and fairy tales you hold nearest and dearest to your heart and ruin them with the truth. Today's episode has got me fired up because we're continuing our deep dive into the mythos behind Disney's Moana and talking about the not one, but two goddesses that inspired the movie's final boss, Teka. Now for those who haven't seen Moana in a while or simply forgot the details about the role Teka plays, she was originally known as Tefiti, the goddess of life, that is until the trickster hero Maui took it upon himself to literally steal her heart in a misguided attempt to give humans the ability to create life. Without her heart, the goddess lost the benevolence and compassion that she once had for mankind and transformed into a vengeful deity called Teka. No longer concerned with the well-being of humanity, everything from the plants, animals, and even the land she created became infected with a plague, causing them to rot away, making it impossible for humans to survive. In my opinion, Teka is one of the more unique Disney antagonists because she's not necessarily an evil being that needs to be defeated, but rather a good one that lost something valuable to her and was consumed by darkness. And the same can actually be said about the two goddesses that inspired her creation. Pele, the goddess of fire, volcanoes, and a whole host of other destructive elements, and Hine Nue Te Po, the goddess of night, death, in the underworld. Those are the lovely ladies that we'll be talking about today, so let's just jump into it. If you haven't yet, make sure you drop a like and subscribe unless you want the goddesses of fire and death to unleash their wrath upon you. I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but by not liking this video, you're kind of saying you don't like Pele, and as you're about to find out, she does not take too kindly to people disrespecting her like that. The irony is she'd probably be more pissed at me for exploiting her on YouTube for likes, so let me just tell you about her and see if we can get her back on my side. So how do I put this? Pele has the exact kind of personality you would expect the embodiment of fire, lightning, wind, and volcanoes to have. She's a fiery one, you might say. The qualities that she's most known for are her incredible power, passion, jealousy, and volatility. She was the daughter of Kuwaha Ilo, aka Maggot Mouth, the man-devouring god who introduced human sacrifice, and Aumia, an ancient earth deity, or in some stories, the personification of the earth, like Gaia. Aumia's other children, Pele's siblings, are all pretty big deals too. There's Kakawa Kahi, the god of war, the beautiful Hiaka, patron goddess of hula dancers and medicine, and many others that all represent different elements of nature like rain and ocean waves. By the way, I just want to say thank you to the Kiwis who commented corrections for my pronunciations in the last Moana video. Those were, without a doubt, the most polite comments of that kind I've ever gotten. The Greek mythology crowd has gotten a lot better as I've established myself in that space, but 23 episodes in and I'm still getting comments that say I'm making people's ears bleed with my pronunciations. Like, like first off, how weak are your ears? Go see a doctor, seriously. And second, half the corrections I receive contradict each other. I was given three different right ways to pronounce Moirai in my video about the fates. It was just so refreshing to be corrected by someone whose intent was to educate instead of trying to prove how smart they think they are. Now the kindness that you showed when I was pronouncing Maori as Maori, I'm gonna need you to extend that to about 10 more words because we cover a lot of new territory in this episode. For example, when Pele was born, she wasn't the god just yet, but rather a kind of being known as a kupua. Maui also fits into this category, by the way. It's kind of like being a demigod, but not really. Basically, I would compare them to the superhumans in the Marvel Universe. They look like people, they act like people, but they have extraordinary abilities that put them above the rest. Now, due to Pele's fiery and, dare I say, egocentric temperament, she was known for starting drama among her siblings. Her worst offense, though, was against her sister Namaka, goddess of the sea. She banged her husband and didn't even say she was sorry. In some versions of the myth, Pele's father punishes her her by sending her away from their home in Tahiti to live elsewhere, but in others, Pele volunteers either because she's eager to explore or wants to get away from the sister she pissed off. Then she's given a canoe by her brother, Kamahoali'i, the king of sharks, and she sails off, joined by a few of her other brothers. Also traveling with Pele is her favorite little sister, Hiaka, who I mentioned earlier. Only at this point, she's still in egg form, though she will go on to be the first of Pele's family to be born on the Hawaiian Islands. Now, originally, they struck land on the island of Kauai and were planning on a establishing themselves there, but they were attacked by Namaka, who just can't seem to get over her sister's betrayal. Well, Pele actually ends up getting her ass kicked and left for dead, but she manages to recover and ends up making her way to Hawaii. Interestingly though, there's a few other kupuas already living on the island. Weyu, kupua of the underground reservoir, Kahupaokani, kupua of Hawaii's springs, Lili Noe, kupua of the mountain mists, and her older sister Poliahu, kupua of the snow. And there's actually a pretty funny myth about the first time they meet Pele. One day they were 
were all sledding down the side of this volcano, Mauna Kea, on the northern side of the island. Not snow sledding, mind you, but lava sledding, which unfortunately is not as cool as it sounds. You're actually just riding a sled down the side of a grassy hill. It still looks awesome and is definitely dangerous, but not quite as much as literal lava sledding would be. Unfortunately, we're not bionicles, so I don't know if we'll ever be able to do that. Anyway, while they were enjoying the activity, the beautiful Pele showed up, introducing herself as Kia Hilele. She asks the gals if she can join them in their contest, and they say, absolutely. Like usual, there's a few different ways the contest goes down, but in all of them, Pele ends up getting jealous of the snow goddess Poliahu's mad skills and goes on to attack her and the other three kupuas with fire and lava. Now, realizing they just pissed off a very powerful fire deity, they start to run away, but Pele's temper is causing an earthquake that's about to set off the volcano they're on. Not wanting the island to be destroyed because of this hothead, the four kupuas combine their powers of snow, water, and mist to create an ice cap on top of the mountain, preventing the flow of lava and saving the day. Now that Pele's powers were effectively cut off, the Kupuas turned to the offensive and attacked her. Then she ran away back to the southern part of the island. So what's really cool about this myth is that it actually explains two natural phenomenon that exist in Hawaii. The first of which being the ice cap that exists on Mauna Kea to this day, and the second being the northern part of the island getting more ocean breeze and precipitation while the southern part gets more dry air. That second phenomenon has also been attributed to her love-hate relationship with the rain Kupua named Kamapua uh-uh, but that's a myth for another video. Right now, I actually want to fast forward to the end of Pele's time as a kupua. See, at some point, her vengeful older sister Namaka finds out that she didn't die in their last battle and resolves to finish the job once and for all. The battle between them was epic. Lava and water were duking it out, with each side gaining the upper hand throughout the scuffle, but in the end, Namaka overpowered Pele and tore her body apart piece by piece. It was then that her soul was released from its physical husk and became one with the volcano known as Kilo which is still active to this day. Don't feel too sorry for Pele though, she's still able to manifest a human form and walk around Hawaii Island. Usually she takes the form of a beautiful young woman or an ugly old beggar lady with a white dog. The legend says that when she's in her beggar form, she'll ask random passers-by for food, water, or shelter. If they're generous and say yes, she'll reward them, but if not, they'll suffer greatly the next time the volcano erupts. Another cool and very famous legend about Pele is that when tourists come to Hawaii and take some of the island's natural beauty, like volcanic rocks, plants, or even sand back home with them, the goddess curses them with bad luck. And you may scoff at that, but every year the National Park Service receives a plethora of natural items through the USPS from tourists asking Pele for forgiveness. Now I guess we know where the folks at Disney got the idea to have Maui steal Tafiti's heart, the resulting curse that afflicted the islands, and his apologetically returning it at the end. Or at least that's part of where they got the idea. As I mentioned earlier, they were also inspired by some myths about the goddess of death, Hina Nui Te Po, and that is who we're talking about next. So we actually talked a little about Maui's experience with this goddess in my last Moana episode, but this time around, we've got a lot more detail. Starting with the basics, Hina Nui Te Po is the goddess of night, death, and the underworld. Roughly translated, her name means Great Woman of Night. The goddess is described as having dark green glowing eyes, teeth as sharp as volcanic glass, a large mouth like a fish, and hair floating in the air as if she were underwater. An interesting detail about Hine is that she was born from the union of Tani Mahuda, the god of peace and beauty, and a mortal woman. But not just any mortal woman, Hini Ahu Oni, the very first mortal woman who was made from clay. Also, she had a different name when she was born, Tiki Kapa Kapa, but that soon changed to Hini Autaria. For those curious about why she changed her name a second time and became Hine Nue Te Po, there's actually a pretty sad myth about it. See, when Hine was born, she somehow didn't know that her father was her father, and when she matured, she not only married him, but bore his children. She does eventually figure out his true identity, though, and because this isn't Greco-Roman mythology, where incest was something every god engaged in just a little bit, she was filled with shame and regret. So much so that she voluntarily descended to the underworld known as Po, or Darkness, to avoid showing her face, and as a result, the goddess went went on to become known as Hini Nui Te Po. Fun fact, before Tefiti's enraged alter ego was named Teka, she was called Te Po. Actually, Lin-Manuel Miranda wrote a song for the movie called Unstoppable that didn't end up being used, and the lyrics refer to Te Po devouring Maui and putting an end to the Polynesians' voyages. Crazy how much storylines change throughout development, isn't it? That's just one of numerous ways we can connect her with the film, though. The other two can be found in myths. Some of you already know the ultra-twisted one that involves her and Maui, so I'm gonna save that one for last. 
after all, that's what you're supposed to do with the best. Instead, I'm going to start with a very cool myth involving two mortals and a trip to the underworld. So in this myth, there's a super good dart thrower named Hutu. He refuses to have sex with this upper class woman named Pa who's super enamored with him and she's so heartbroken from the rejection that she hangs herself. In response, her servants capture and try to kill Hutu for what he did, which technically was nothing. I gotta say, I've not had sex a lot of times before. This is the worst ever. <laughs> the good news is he managed to escape that horrible fate by promising that he would retrieve Pa's soul from the underworld and bring her back to life. Kind of a ridiculous promise, but the servants figure he'll either succeed or die trying, so they agree. Then Hutu does the appropriate incantation to fix Pa's broken neck before traveling to the underworld. On his way there, he comes across our girl Hine and gives her a token to let him pass. And in response, she tells him how to descend into the underworld so that he'll land on his feet. Now remember the way that Maui and Moana entered Lalotai, the realm of the monsters? It's basically the same thing. You jump into a deep pit, make your way through a layer of ocean water, and if you're lucky, you'll land on your feet. If not, you'll land on your head or maybe even someone else. Well, she's dead. It's also worth mentioning that there's a deleted scene where Maui describes Lalotai as a place where monsters go after they die. And in earlier drafts of the story, it was a realm of spirits, not monsters, making it resemble the underworld that Hutu is traveling to that much more. Well, you'll be happy to hear that Hutu does manage to find Pa's soul and restores it to her body. The myth has kind of a weird ending though, because instead of going back to his family, part of the reason he didn't want to hook up with her in the first place, he stays in the village and marries Pa. Those poor kids. I guess that's what happens when you try to get someone like a dart thrower to settle down though. Those dudes just have too many options. Moving on to the Maui myth though, it's probably the most famous of the stories that Hine's involved in and the other source of the inspiration for him stealing Tafiti's heart in the movie. See, Maui, who loved doing favors for the humans, believed that death was degrading and an insult to the dignity of mankind. So for the trickster hero's final trick, he wanted to grant immortality to humans. And the way he was going to do this was, he was going to reverse the birthing process on Hine in one hole, out the other. He convinced his four brothers to join him on his search for her, and when they found the goddess sleeping, he turned them all into birds so they could watch from the trees above. He also warned them not to laugh at him while he was working his magic, which ironically is a detail I find hilarious. Now he then turned himself into a worm, which when you think about it, really makes a gross amount of sense, and then crawled right up inside the goddess. The problem was Maui's brothers couldn't help but laugh at the hilarious image, so Hine woke up and crushed Maui between the obsidian teeth that lined her lady parts. Now there's actually another part of this story I didn't mention last time and that explains why Maui was destined to be killed. Back in the day when Makia Tutara, Maui's father and the guardian of the underworld was performing Maui's baptism, he messed up part of the incantation and as a result, Maui became vulnerable. Maui is also a trickster hero and Hine, the collector of souls and goddess of death, is referred to as the one being who cannot be tricked. Being that Maui was always upping the ante on his hijinks, it was inevitable that he push it too far and challenge death itself and as a result, that had to be his end. Well, maybe he didn't have to go out in that specific way. I just meant that she had to be the one to take him out. But yeah, that was a brief overview of the two goddesses that inspired Teka. Today, I wanted to focus on the stories and details that related most to the movie, but there's quite a few more we could have gotten into, so I think I'll have to make individual videos about each of them in the future. Well, them and some of the other wild and interesting characters that make up Polynesian mythology. Let me know in a comment if that's something you would want to see, or if you have any recommendations for specific stories and characters characters you want me to cover. And while you're doing that, let me tell you about this week's sponsor, Skillshare. One thing that I think is so cool about mythology, whether it's Greek, Norse, Polynesian, or one of the many others, is that each deity has their own specialty. Zeus, Odin, Pele, they each have their own area of expertise. But what about you, person watching this? Is there a domain that you consider yourself to be an expert in? If not, then boy have I got the solution for you. Skillshare is an online learning community where millions come together to take their creative talents to the next level. Whether you consider yourself to be an amateur or an expert in all things, they have something to offer you in the exact realm you're looking for. Illustration courses, photography courses, creative writing courses, and literally thousands of others. One of their newest courses I'm most excited for is Mastering Illustration with Jazza. It covers the essentials of sketching, inking, and color, and I know would be an excellent fit for the many artists in the solo fam. It'd probably be smart for me to check it out too, being that most of my drawings look like this. I mean, that's just embarrassing. What's also amazing about Skillshare is how accessible the platform 
platform is, a membership for an entire year will cost you less than $10 a month. To make that deal even sweeter though, if you follow my promo link in the description, you could get two months of premium membership free so you know whether or not Skillshare is for you. I know, my generosity knows no bounds. You're welcome. Solo fam, it pains me to say this, but it's time for us to part ways. Don't fret though, we can see each other again soon. All you have to do is hit those like and subscribe buttons. Not only are you supporting the channel and helping our family of freaks and geeks grow to new heights, you're also telling the YouTube algorithm, hey, I wanna see more of this guy. He seems nice and he's not bad to look at. But if just following on YouTube isn't enough for you, I also encourage you to follow my Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Not only is it the best way to stay updated on Messed Up Origins news, but it's a great backup for being notified when I upload because YouTube system refuses to work half the time. And one last thing for your to-do list, follow my son on Instagram. His name is Gunther, and I think we can all agree that a modeling career is in his future. I'll be seeing you all again next Friday with yet another episode of Messed Up Origins where I'll be talking about Mary Had a Little Lamb. Until that day comes though, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first. Thank you.